the more that you can do on the pre-breach side from a privacy policy, procedure, um, training, workshops, right, tabletops, security assessments, all of that, you can show your potential insurer all the things you've done, right? Hopefully get through that rigorous underwriting process. And at the same time, be ready for, for those privacy laws that are coming into effect later this year and into next year. So more important than ever, and I know time is critical um, and, and dollars are, are, are tight, but, but more than ever, it's really important. We are looking at our cyber hygiene. Hey everyone, uh, this is Vinny Sikor from Net Diligence. It's a pleasure for uh, us to have uh, Dom from McDonald Hopkins. And uh, Dominic and I have known each other for, oh, gosh, I don't know, almost uh, probably five years, uh, you know, you know, at least five years, I, I would say. And he's with McDonald Hopkins and they're one of our platinum breach coach firms. Um, you know, he's one of the most active lawyers that I've met in the industry. And I'm really excited to have him with us and uh, we're going to talk about uh, some trends that they've seen, as well as where where he thinks things are going to be going in 2022. And and Dom, I just thought maybe let's just start by having you just take a minute, introduce yourself, talk about where the firm is now. I mean, it seems like you're constantly adding lawyers and the team's growing. So I'd love to just kind of get a status update on where the firm is. Great. Thanks, Vinny. Great, great to see you. And thanks, everybody, for, uh, for tuning in here. Uh, I'm Dom Paluzzi. I co-chair our data privacy and cyber practice at McDonald Hopkins. And yes, Vinny, definitely steady growth for, for our team. Uh, the nice thing, uh, one of the nice things, I guess, came in, coming out of COVID is we're not restricted to our physical offices. So we've really uh, increased uh, both in, in capacity and, and, and geographical areas. So um, really excited about some of our new additions, including uh, a former assistant attorney general from the state of Indiana which uh, we all know in incident response, uh, they are the most active attorney general. So really excited to have uh, have Heather on our team um, and, and really some really great additions and, and more to come real soon too. So we're really excited and ready for a, another uh, wild ride in 2022. Wow, that's great. Um, yeah, everybody everybody loves working with Heather. So that that's a huge win for the firm to, to have her join the team. Um, so I guess before we move on to 22, can you just kind of give me an update on, um, I mean, you have so many areas of your firm that are active, but what were some of the most active areas of, of, the, of the firm in terms of what you saw and maybe the last half of the year, you know, at the end of the year? I mean, it, sure. it's crazy how in cybersecurity one month is like a year because so much happens, <laughs> but, right. but why don't we just start, why don't we just start there? Right, right. Yeah, I, I, I've been telling, you know, everybody that uh, while uh, a lot has changed, a lot of this has, has also remained the same. And if we look at the last part of, of 21, uh, much of that was true, right? Obviously, ransomers, right? Uh, we hear all, all kinds on that. That's that's what makes the news. That's what's interesting and fascinating. Uh, but we saw a real uptick in, in the BECs and the wire fraud towards the end. Um, and then and then the third is certainly the third party vendor breaches. And, and I'll talk about a little bit more of that to come in, in 22 here uh, coming up. But I, I definitely think that is um, going to be a, a true trend or the third party breaches. You know, we can have everything safe and secure under our own roof, but we pass that sensitive data on to a third party uh, and they have a ransomware attack. They have some sort of compromise or malware. Um, and we're seeing it really affect a lot of downstream clients. So um, tremendous increase in, in exfiltration of data, um, the, the, the boldness of the threat actors, right? The calling people, harassments, posting on social media. I remember years ago, right? We were able to really keep data security incidents quiet until we really had all of the facts, were able to you know, really have our forensics completed, our notification and communication plan set, and that at that time, and we were able to sort of really gauge and control that, we'd go forward. Now, you know, you're down and out and threat actors are posting about you um, right away and going onto social media and reaching out to your employees. Um, so it, it's caused, you know, uh, even more concern uh, amongst an organization who is trying to deal with, you know, the hour by hour, minute by minute triaging of these types of incidents. So more important than ever, is to have the team assembled ahead of time while things are calm, 
practicing incidents, tabletop exercises, improving that incident response plan, getting that team together. And it's challenging, right? We're not all under the same roof anymore. Everybody's working remote or some hybrid environment. Um, so got to make sure we're practicing as a team um, because uh, it, it's really more important than ever as these uh, security incidents are becoming more and more complex. You know, that, that actually brings up a great point, uh, Dom. You know, I remember, I remember when I was doing incident response, we used to bring in crisis communications kind of near the end. You know what I mean? They, like we would notify a crisis communications group, hey, um, you know, we're working on a letter and, you know, we've got some work to do, but, you know, let's, let's bring you in. But there really wasn't as much to do on, on day one, right? <laughs> Um, and that's a really interesting, you know, comment that you made about how the the threat actors have have morphed, and that they're just getting involved, and it's all going public. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Like, do you find that your firm has to get involved in crisis communications earlier because your clients just weren't ready for it to go public day one? Right. Yeah. But you know, on on that very first intake call we're talking about communications, right? Obviously we're triaging forensics on that call, our threat actor negotiation firms, right? So we're, of course, that is, that is a primary concern from a technical perspective, but more than ever, we are talking about standby holding statements. You know, are there certain stakeholders we need to be communicating with right away? The regulatory uh, scrutiny has increased tremendously along with the guidelines and the regulations where they're wanting notice within hours, right? So really coming up with that communications playbook. And you're right, Vinny, we used to kind of do that at the very end, right? Um, let's bring in a crisis communication firm to check the letter, right? And think about any other communications that need to go out at the end, because we used to be able to keep this really under wraps and, and gone are those days, right? So uh, whether it's your breach coach that, that's helping you or there's great crisis communication firms that can supplement um, and work with our clients, internal marketing folks, uh, but communications and developing a playbook and, and coming up with those standby holding statements because the, the days of responding with no comment or not responding, these reporters, these cyber bloggers are going to come up with their own story. And that reminds me of another thing, a new trend we are seeing is that once we give notice to a lot of these AGs, right, they're posting, they have their walls of shame, these cyber bloggers, um, so it's not our media notices that are required that are getting the attention, it's the cyber bloggers checking the AG walls of shame and then coming up with a story. They see the numbers, they have the facts, they have the dates. Um, so there's a lot we have to give to these AGs. They then post it. These cyber bloggers are then taking it live and, and, and that's the story that's driving uh, the news. Yeah, I, you know, I hadn't considered that. Um, what's the, what, what's the ch how would you describe the regulatory environment? Because I was talking to a friend of mine and one of the things that um, I heard, and I haven't been able to validate, so maybe you could kind of validate for me, is before we kind of used to know who we were going to be dealing with when there was an incident, but now because things get pushed so quickly, it seems like there's more regulators involved than before. You know, before if it was a healthcare case, you knew you're going to be dealing with, you know, HIPAA and, and it was pretty contained, but now it just, um, I, I've almost heard the term wild, wild west when it comes to like which regulators kick in. Would you agree, disagree? Like, you know. Yeah, it's funny. I, I, I used that term with my team just yesterday. I said the regulator bodies, it is wild, wild west. Um, not only amongst the state AGs, right? The usual suspects we're still hearing from, right? Indiana, Massachusetts, but there are new ones coming out of the woodwork, right? And a lot of the AGs have now really streamlined their reporting process more online tracking, which tells me, right, they're now getting much more of this data, they're collecting it, and now they're able to go after, right, and, 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 and you know, distribute data requests and really come down hard on enforcement action. So that's on the state side, but we're seeing, yeah, on the, right, on the federal side as well, right, wild, wild west, uh, depending obviously what, what industry, but, but lots, of, lots of hands in the cookie jar, as I also like to say. Um, you know, we're not seeing the ultimate fines and penalties, assuming that you comply with their requests, right? So more data requests, more, you know, what are we doing moving forward, safeguards, policies, procedures, training, right? Um, patching, risk assessments, all those things, um, the AGs are, are, and all of the regulators, they're, they're getting um, a, a lot more in tune with what they need to be asking. Um, and they're asking it 
a lot more quicker. Um, so we're getting those requests right away. Um, so it's really more important than ever that we have all of those pre-breach items in place, right? I know we're always focused on the incident response. That's the busiest. That's what requires the immediate attention. But because these regulators are asking not just about the incident, but it's really an opportunity for you to show them, right? Vet, vet your dirty laundry or also on the flip side, show them everything that you've done, right? Your full compliance. So more important than ever to, to be looking at that pre-breach side. Yeah, that's 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 uh, that's funny. <laughs> that's funny. We both use the same term. Um, well, I want to shift a little bit because we we don't we only only have about a few more minutes, so I'd like to shift to um, to 2022. And and Dom, I always like asking. I was telling you know the team, I always like asking you questions like this because you're 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 actually you're actually very active, and so you see a lot. Even um, some of my friends at the FBI that know you, they they talk about how 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 active your firm is and the, the amount of experience you have. And so, I mean, what do you see going forward in 2022? You know, we're almost a full month in. And so you, you've probably seen Microsoft released 96 patches on Patch Tuesday. What a great way to start off the year. Um, so, you know, it hasn't slowed down at all. But what, I mean, what do you think, like what, what are, are some trends that you're, you're seeing that you think are gonna continue in 2022 or what are some new ones? Um, that like our insurance community should should know about. Sure, yeah, I, you know the zero days, the, the patching, the log four J right, the ransomware, the email compromises, all of that's expected, and 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 that you know in the first couple of weeks here, uh, no surprise, that's all all maintained. But um, third party breaches, um, I'm going to continue to harp on that, um, as we all know, what a, a gigantic uh, HR vendor right goes down at the at the end of the year. Uh, is still down, causing gigantic business continuity issues. Um, they're still in the forensic investigation. So more than ever, it's really important that we are doing an assessment of what third parties house our data, which ones have the sensitive PII, and, and what are we doing to, to make sure that, that they have, you know, safeguards, that they have the endpoint monitoring. All the things that, you know, you as an organization are worried about and have implemented well, again, once you take that data from your secure environment, passing it down to a third party, um, you know, off to the races, right? Well, what are they doing? Uh, what kind of security do they have in place? What kind of timing requirements do they have, right? Can they wait a month? Can they wait two months to give you notice about an incident? That shouldn't be the case, right? More and more regulators are looking and, and, and saying, hey, the, the vendor's timeline is your timeline. You assume that, right? You selected and contracted with this vendor. So the fact that the vendor waits 30, 45 days and you have a breach notice statute of 30 days, well, we're going to hold you to that, right? So it's really, really important. We're looking at our contracts, our provisions. And I realize sometimes these vendors are mammoth, right? So you have a bit of a disparity between in, in negotiation. Um, but wh where, you, where you can negotiate those contracts, please do. And for the ones that you can't, Please make sure you're getting as much, you know, on the assurance side of, of what they have in place uh, from a from a from a safeguard, security, endpoint monitoring and patching and multi-factor, all those things, right? Because again, it's still a huge misconception. 15 years later, we've been I've been dealing with this. There's a huge misconception. Oh, the vendor had the breach, it's all on them. That's not the way it works. That's not how the contracts work, and that's not how the law works, right? You are the data owner, you take that data in. And it's up to you, right? Whether whether the vendor, you know, uh, handles the notice and the breach, great. Uh, but you're still obligated. You're still on the hook as that data owner, as the covered entity. So really important uh, that we're vetting our our third party vendors that have access to either our critical systems, those managed service providers, or or those really important vendors that have all of our sensitive personal information. Thanks, Tom. Um, wow, I wish I wish we had like 20 more minutes because I have like all these follow up questions from what you just said, but I think maybe where we'll end is. Um, is how about one takeaway for the, you know, the insurers, the brokers, um, you know, just as they kind of move forward in 2022. Sure, obviously we have a hardening, you know, cyber market, uh, a little bit more rigorous underwriting process and not that my my team handles any kind of coverage issues, but of course we hear from our insurance, right? So that, and you couple with the laws that are coming into effect in 22, 23 on the pre-breach, on the information security side, it's almost like the worlds are coming together on those two fronts, right? 
And at the end of the day, what does that mean? So for our insured clients, that pre-breach side, right? Not to sound like a broken record, but the more that you can do on the pre-breach side from a privacy policy, procedure, um, training, workshops, right? Tabletops, security assessments, all of that, you can show your potential insurer all the things you've done, right? Hopefully get through that rigorous underwriting process. And at the same time, be ready for, for those privacy laws that are coming into effect later this year and into next year. So more important than ever, and I know time is critical, um, and, and dollars are, are, are tight, but, but more than ever, it's really important. We are looking at our cyber hygiene. It's gonna help you on the incident response side too, and hopefully avoid some breaches. Thanks, Dom. Um, really appreciate your time. Just a quick reminder, everybody, you know, you know Dom's with McDonald Hopkins. Um, they're one of our platinum level breach coach firms, one of the best firms in the industry that I've, I've worked with. And, um, and, and Dom's definitely an expert in the field. So, so Dom, you mentioned those privacy laws coming up in the future. Um, you know, that's, that's something I think everybody uh, should monitor. And it seems like it's gonna, it's gonna change, it's gonna be another like change the game kind of moment in our industry. And so I think that's really important. Um, Dom, I guess I'll see you in person, hopefully at one of our events, we're back for sure. your business, so to speak. And, and so hopefully it'll be somewhere warm because I don't know about you, but it, right. it, it's been a cold winter. Um, same so, here, same here in Detroit. All right. Thanks everybody. Really appreciate you, Dom. And, uh, and for our net diligence community, have a great day.